Hello, my name is Rivka Isaacson. I'm a biophysicist and I work in the chemistry department at King's College London. Hi, I'm Anne Witheridge and I'm a painter, a figurative painter, and I founded London Fine Art Studios in London 15 years ago and I teach uh, figurative representational art in an atelier method. So I was at school and I was studying GCSE German, the second year of GCSE. So it was a very exciting and momentous occasion for us because suddenly the German language became even more real and all the stories of Germany became an exciting moment for us as young children. Awesome. I was a couple of years younger and it definitely didn't have the same impact on me. But in, in more recent years, I've learned way more about it from books and talks and general um, cultural stuff. Um, well, I actually had quite an unusual upbringing in a very religious community which discouraged personal ambition. And I think I thought that when I was an adult, I would have loads of children and bake a lot. Um, as it turns out, I do bake quite a lot. And I have two children only um which is a nice manageable number <laughs> uh, what about you Anne? actually i i always wanted to be um to be an artist and because i come from a family where there are lots of um artists and also people from religious backgrounds it was always a very acceptable choice to to be a painter so i didn't i didn't meet with any um challenges by my family and actually my father was always encouraging me to, to paint and draw. So I suppose I was very lucky. I also wanted, I always used to say I wanted so many children that I couldn't see my kitchen floor. And I have two children. And I didn't realize it was because I was going to have such a small kitchen. <laughs> well, viewing the invisible breaks down the wall between arts and sciences. It's a wall that hasn't always been there and it's variably permeable depending on where you are geographically and socially. But particularly in the UK, the education system has a tendency to funnel students in a scientific or um, humanities direction from an early age. And as a result, there's a lack of understanding and a lot of misconceptions between the communities. So we found a selection of science influences from different walks of life, education, politics, media, etc. And we got artists to paint their portraits and we filmed the discussions between the artists and scientists and we turned it into an exhibition um, to bring lots of other people along on our journey of discovery. We identified a lot of common ground between uh, the ways in which scientists and artists work and we really brought out the creativity involved in science and the technical precision um, which, uh, of art which are both under acknowledged areas. I was amazed actually by how technical the process of portrait painting is and how all the different stages had really clear parallels with solving molecular structures, which is what we do in our lab. So for example, like we both have to identify our initial subject, like for you, it'll be a, a person to paint their portrait. For me, it would be a protein to solve the structure. And we both have the idea that if people are learning, like to help students learn skills, we start with something tried and tested, um, like for example, we'll use a protein where the structure is already well known, where we know it behaves well. You would have a model that you've used lots of times and you know they're gonna behave themselves and be have the right structure to paint and to learn the skills. But then once we're trying to create big impact with our original work, we need to choose uh, someone or something that's got like a big selling point. Like I might have to choose, you know, a, a, cor a coronavirus protein, for example, to solve or, um, or you might choose somebody who's in some way famous or has like an unusual look about them or, you know, something like that. And then every step beyond that, optimizing the conditions, iterating the process, there were just so many parallels and we ended up making that into a storyboard for our exhibition. And for me, what I found uh, very exciting and, and surprised me is that as, as a visual artist, and I work in a world which is very visual, 
I understand that concept from painting and I didn't understand how Rivka was going to make it possible with her diagrams and her storyboarding and yet the storyboards that she produced to go alongside each stage of the portrait were very beautiful and just as artistically creative to me and artistically satisfying as our paintings. So far, a lot of people who've engaged with our project said it made them think very differently um, and that they were really inspired to change their working practice. Artists were inspired to start collaborating with scientists. Teachers said they will really encourage their students to see the interrelations of art and sciences and not see them as pointing in different directions. And scientists were inspired to nurture their creative side by signing up to online art classes and lots of other projects. Um, our next phase, which we're working on at the moment, really takes our project into a social action direction. We're planning to take scientists and artists into schools to do live portrait paintings and workshops with the children and ultimately provide corridor exhibitions to normalize visibilities of role models like the children. We're planning that the portraits of the scientists should be really diverse. I think there's still a long way to go in a, a lot of this. I mean, I live in a very right on neighborhood, but I still found that my kids were subjected to extreme gender stereotyping like at, at nursery, including the idea that scientific thinking is more of a boy thing and artsy stuff is more for girls. Um, I find this stuff very frustrating and like racism and other forms of prejudice, I try and call it out at every opportunity and take whatever steps I can to combat it. Yeah, I, I think I, I completely agree, um, especially the idea at school, because my girls are a little bit older, that they've already just been slotted in as the artistic um, types and, you know, they're good at reading and, and therefore the, the science is just left behind, especially I think in the, um, the English state school system where science isn't given as much, you know, importance or weight as, um, as you know, English and mathematics. And obviously they have a lot of art in their life because of me, but I'd also love them to have a lot of science. So it became as natural to them as, as the painting side. Well, I personally, I'm really sold on the value of sleep. And there are so many things to worry about at the moment that are all interconnected. So I do try hard to separate myself from the weight of the world at bedtime. I actually feel we're in a really exciting time for interdisciplinary research. And I'm embracing that and just thinking about more and more ways to facilitate. Well, I was very lucky to have special visitors to our exhibition and they had a really good time. I think their favourite bit was we had a display case with all the equipment from science and arts and they had to work out, you know, what's for science and what's for arts. And I have to say, even though I stole half of those things from my own lab, I had trouble really deciding what, what was science and what was art. It was so much overlap. And what about your kids? My my children absolutely loved it. They were they were a little bit older. They were, um they were eight and ten at the time, and um, they were really excited to see all the projects. They loved that display box and they loved the the videos. But they also loved looking at the um, the portraits and the storyboards and trying to match up the stages of the portrait with the storyboard and trying to make sense of the molecular structures.